Rising above the battlefield in World War II is the bomber aircraft of the future. Carrying 20 machine guns and 52,000 pounds of explosives, this impenetrable flying fortress was more efficient than strategic bombers of the day, cheaper to build, and could even run sorties from the American mainland. But the Flying Wing project would be shrouded in controversy, criticized as a leap too far, forsaken by the government, and perhaps even sabotaged by spies. This is the incredible story of the Northrop XB-35 Flying Wing. The XB-35 Flying Wing could have only existed thanks to one man, Jack Northrop, a brilliant engineer who realized that aircraft design had gone in the wrong direction. The sole purpose of a plane is to fly and thus all these extra areas like fuselage, tail and more don't really contribute to its main objective of generating lift. So why not make a plane that was just the wing? In 1941, in the troubled beginnings of World War II, Northrop was commissioned to come up with a new 10,000 by 10,000 long-range bomber, one that could carry 10,000 pounds of bombs to a range of 10,000 miles. These figures were not arbitrary, but actually proposed just in case that the USA found itself in a cross-Atlantic war by themselves with Nazi Germany. The bombers needed to be able to fly an entire sortie without landing near or in Europe. To reach the range, he advocated his insane flying wing design in an effort to eliminate the parasitic drag and remove unnecessary structural weight. In theory, this design could not only fly further than traditional means, but carry more bombs and cost the taxpayer less. A triple win. This won him a prototype award and he could work on making his flying wing dream a reality. He would be going up against the very best in the industry, Boeing and Convair, whom were tinkering with their own B-36 design. His prototype not only had to win the soon-to-be war, but also beat the brightest minds in the industry. The stakes were high, and this is what they came up with. The XB-35 flying wing would have a total wing of 53 feet and a wingspan of 172 feet. As the whole aircraft was the wing, it would have a huge wing area of 4,000 square feet, roughly 370 meters squared, giving it an aspect ratio of 7 to 4, nearly the same wing area as a Boeing 777-300 today, a plane that easily dwarfs this aircraft in size. The aircraft also had an impressively small radar cross-section that would be very useful for stealth operations, which I'll get to later. Inside, it had a very much traditional cabin that you would find on a normal plane, including a tail cone protruding from the back with a little window, despite the flying wing design not actually having a tail. This would act as a remote sighting station and a viewpoint for the tail gunner. In the middle of the cabin, there was a crew rest area with bunk beds for the long missions, and the wings would house six small bomb bays, three in each wing with rollaway doors. The blueprints also mentioned that the aircraft had big enough bomb bays to carry certain bigger bombs, say those from Project Manhattan, that were currently under development without modification. For the mission, the aircraft would have a crew of nine personnel, a pilot captain, a co-pilot, a bombardier, a navigator, an engineer, a radio operator, and of course, three gunners to operate the 20 machine guns located in six nests around the fuselage, including a single tail stinger position. Speaking of armament, this bomber aircraft could also carry up to 52,000 pounds of bombs or 23,000 kilos of explosives. 
With four pusher propellers 15 feet across, four and a half meters wide, the aircraft would have a cruise speed of 240 miles per hour, which is around 390 kilometers per hour, and a range of 12,000 kilometers or six and a half thousand nautical miles on a single fuel tank. It had a goal cruise altitude of 39,000 feet or 12,000 meters, but that was actually restricted to 20,000 feet due to APU problems, which I'll get to in a moment. Things were looking up and 200 bombers were ordered by the Air Force with the first to enter the war in 1944. But with such concept aircraft, sometimes things don't exactly go according to plan. The design took so long that the war came and went, and when it finally took to the skies in 1946, it was perceived to be a little bit more antiquated than some of the jet aircraft that the Air Force had seen deployed by the Germans at the end of the war. Whilst its initial test flights were without incident, it turns out that the propellers on the plane hadn't actually been investigated to see if they worked with the engines on board. The highly efficient contra-rotating propellers began to vibrate loose from the Pratt & Whitney engines, causing frustration for the engineers. As it turns out, these engines and propellers had been selected and provided to Northrop by the Air Force without testing or even securing a guarantee that they would work, as if someone had made a backroom deal. Worse still, nobody would take responsibility for the mistake, and no one would cough up the extra funding to replace these engines. Conversations got heated, and needless to say, I'm sure a lot of people said things that they didn't mean. In the end, the engineers were forced to adopt a single rotating propeller on each engine, slowing the plane down. Because the relations had soured between the Air Force and Northrop, the Air Force refused to give them a specific AC electrical alternator for the onboard electrical systems. Thus, the plane had to use its own onboard auxiliary power unit, limiting its ability to fly higher than 15,000 feet or 4,500 meters, which is pretty low for a strategic bomber. Lastly, in an effort to put Northrop in a hard place, the Air Force demanded that the aircraft be able to carry new and bigger atomic bombs under design, otherwise they wouldn't buy it. However, it required a small modification on the part of Northrop, a modification that the Air Force refused to allow. A solution to all these problems appeared with the arrival of the jet engine. Why not stick on some jet engines onto the plane to make it a lot faster, and thus no one had to take blame for the electrical or engine problems. It would also require a slight redesign of the fuselage, and Northrop would be able to slip in bigger bomb bays for those atomic bombs. Again, another triple win. But things didn't exactly go as planned. This new version of the plane, now dubbed the YB-49, would fly much faster and higher than the original, especially with its power supply problems. Initial tests in 1948 with eight jet engines allowed the airframe to reach 40,000 feet, 12,000 meters, and topped out at 520 miles per hour or 840 kilometers per hour a very impressive performance. However, the range was greatly reduced and no longer could the plane fill in the role of a grand strategic bomber, a mission profile that had now switched to hitting Russian factories in the USSR. Still, 13 YB-49s managed to get ordered by the Air Force as nothing would be comparably available until well into the mid-1950s. But alas, it seems like that bad luck would follow the project. Of the 13 orders, one crashed in 1948 during stall tests, killing two famous test pilots, Major Daniel Forbes of Forbes Air Force Base fame and Captain Glenn Edwards of Edwards Air Force Base, as well as three other crew members. During a follow-up test flight for then President Truman in Washington, four of the jet engines seized up due to a lack of oil, revealing that the oil had not been replaced at its last maintenance stop. 
Odd that such a critical step had been missed by the ground engineers. The last operational prototype was then destroyed in a freak landing gear accident in 1950 during an unusual taxi test. The plane had had its fuel tank filled to the brim and was racing around the ground when the front wheel encountered unusual severe vibrations and collapsed. This rupture caused a small fire which then engulfed and destroyed the entire airframe. Why was the fuel tank full when the plane wasn't even flying that day? Very odd indeed. The other 11 uncompleted prototypes were converted to other prototypes of other designs, such as a spy version called the YRB-49A. It had extra fuel tanks on the wings to get around the pesky range problem and seemingly was the perfect aircraft design. It had fixed all the faults of the previous versions and was winning some support in the Air Force ranks. However, pretty quickly the order for 30 was cancelled without explanation from senior officials. As different people got promoted or moved around, the project landed on the desk of those unfamiliar with the drama and questioned all the back and forth with Air Force Command, as well as crash tests and odd problems. Was this plane really worth all this effort? And then in stepped our good friends at Boeing and Convair, who said, Guys, guys, the solution to your long-range problem is right here, the B-36. That's right, the flying wing was still going up against the Convair B-36 pacemaker. But pace? Peace? Peacemaker? Peacemaker. Boy, good thing I didn't leave out that E from the script, that sure would have been embarrassing. Anyway, this more traditional competitor was seen as a safer alternative that worked and was heavily lobbied by Convair in Washington. Having to choose between the two, the government ended up grounding the Flying Wing program. The last Flying Wing prototype would end up in Ontario Airport, sitting by the runway weathering for two years, until finally being scrapped in December 1953. The Smithsonian, a large museum in the United States, actually asked for this final prototype to be preserved as part of a focus on Northrop, but was declined by the current Air Force Secretary, Stuart Symington. Near the very end of the program, Northrop had also been working on a new engine design themselves to finally make the flying wing work. But what seems to be the final insult, all the Northrop data, patents, and even the Turbodyne engine name was given to rival General Electric. The remaining models, airframes, and other components at their facility were destroyed by Air Force officials who brought portable smelters on big trucks to their headquarters the very next day after the grounding ruling. They asked the team members to take the last 20 years of hard work and personally destroyed it in front of them. The end of this program devastated Jack, and he would retire from the aviation industry soon after, never realizing his dream of a more superior way to fly. In the end, the failure of this program is obvious in hindsight. The program was heavily delayed, used obsolete piston engine technology, and was over budget. There were also too many experimental branches, and development was spread too thinly away from the core product. The military seeking a solution to the Soviet problem needed a bomber now and the Convair B-36 was more of a conservative design despite being on paper more expensive and less efficient. The generals decided it would be better to just throw more money at a more realizable idea than bet the house on something more experimental. Like all major projects, there is also the fact that you need a little elbow grease in Washington to get it across the line, something that rival Convair was able to do far more effectively than the highly Wild West Jack Northrop. Now, like all the times I do this, I want to warn viewers that this next part is totally unproven and it's time to get your tinfoil hats out. Because 
we're going to discuss conspiracies. According to Jack Northrop, the flying wing was cancelled by the Air Force because they wanted him to merge his company with Convair, the builders of the B-36. Apparently in an interview, he claimed the merger demands were grossly unfair to Northrop, and in retribution, the Air Force Secretary Stuart Symington killed the program. Perhaps through spying or industrial espionage or withholding critical design technology that the Air Force had in abundance, the program did actually spiral out of control and end up having all these problems. And that he wanted us, without question, to merge with Consolidated Voltee, which was then operating a government-owned plant in Fort Worth, building the B-36. Robbing the world of this incredible flying wing design. What are the alternatives to this demand you are making of our merger with Consolidated Voltee? He said, alternatives? You'll be goddamn sorry if you don't. Oh, and on a completely unrelated side note, that Air Force Secretary Stuart Symington actually left the Air Force a few years later and then landed a job as the president of Convair. What a happy, lucky coincidence. Of course, everything that I've just said has been looked into by various different journalists. And in fact, an investigation into this whole project, including interviews with the Secretary of the Air Force himself, paints a slightly more reasonable picture. Basically, after looking at the project and the financials of the time, there wasn't enough work to go around for all these plane makers. That it was incredibly clear that the North Rope project wasn't going to be selected, and in order to save as many jobs as possible, the Air Force suggested that these two firms merge. But let me know down in the comments what you think. Who is really to blame here? As for Northrop, they would not walk away empty-handed. They would end up winning a consolidation contract for the conventional F-89 Scorpion jet interceptor, which would then go on to have quite the exciting career with over 1,500 built. And that flying wing design? Well, it would be invaluable to create the impressive B-2 stealth bomber, which truly deserves its own video. In a final note, in 1980, a now aged and wheelchair bound Jack Northrop was taken to the top secret design studio and shown the under development prototype of the B-2 bomber. He recognized the same lines and the same wingspan of the flying wing he had championed nearly 40 years earlier and said, I know why God has kept me alive for the last 25 years. He would pass 10 months later. If you love this video, I suggest you check out my companion piece about the Lockheed VTOL aircraft that they tried to build in the 1950s. Or if you haven't seen it yet, consider checking out the Convair Fish, a crazy supersonic spy plane that was designed to be better than the Lockheed SR-71. This video ended up being way longer and way more interesting than I ever dreamed, and I'm really surprised how crazy this story ended up going. Like you guys, I actually discover these stories as I write them, and I could not wait to get this to you. So I actually fast tracked this project over some of the other ones that I'm currently working on. If you want to see behind the scenes work and see how I actually make these videos, then I suggest you jump onto the Discord that I've got linked down in the description. It's like a live chat sort of form where you can meet other people who love the channel and can talk about the latest videos that come out and other secret projects that I'm working on. Also, if you'd like to see the videos early or perhaps suggest future topics, then I suggest that you join our Patreon. I couldn't have done this project without their help and to them, I want to say thank you. As for the rest of you guys, I hope you subscribe and that you catch me in a few more days for the next episode of Found and Explained.